take a seat if you are here for Afrofuturism. And even if you're not, take a seat. Uh, I'm Tavia Nyong'o. I'm the curator of public programs here at the Armory, and it's just a joy to see everyone in the room today and uh, yesterday. I really feel this is um, kind of an unprecedented gathering, and uh, hopefully uh, the first but not the last. I'm so honored to be sharing the stage here with uh, Sharifa Ali and Yushin Chen. Both of their uh, bios are in your house program, so I'll encourage you to uh, look at those. But we're also going to kind of do a, a collective biography <laughs> of sort of how we met seven years ago at uh, a production of the Yale Dramat and uh, where we are today and where we might be going in the future. Um, so that's going to be really exciting. Let me just find my questions. OK, great. So. When I was approached to um, co-organize this event with uh, uh, Jane Cox, someone who you both know well, I think, um, I was assigned the Afrofuturism panel, <laughs> and I was like, I'm happy to do that, you know? Um, and I, there's so many different ways into the question of Afrofuturism, but given that we're centered on design, I was really drawn to a question in, um, inspired by a quote from Octavia Butler's Parables, uh, a Parable of the Sower. And in that book, Butler, or rather her protagonist, uh, Lauren writes, all that you change, sorry, all that you touch, you change. All that you change, changes you. The only lasting truth is change. It struck me this is like a really beautiful meditation for a director and a designer, and I wanted to begin by asking the two of you, what does this quotation mean to you uh, as a designer, Yushin, and as an interdisciplinary artist, director, and producer, Sharifa? All that you touch, you change. All that you change, changes you. Wow. <laughs> That's an incredible quotation, and I think an even uh, larger extension of that is that God is change, and that's incredible. As we sit here in this, let's say, loaded space that is the Park Avenue Armory, um, we, in fact, are changing this space by virtue of being here, by having these com uh, conversations, by uh, looking up at those portraits, the many portraits in the space, and having them look down on us. And when I think about how that relates to the the practice of theater making, and um, I'm really interested in Sankofa, which is an Afrofuturist principle, uh, which is often depicted as a bird, and this bird has its feet firmly on the ground, facing forwards as if walking towards the future, and the head of the bird is often uh, facing backwards, looking at the past, and the sort of thing that is often represented in the beak or just outside of the beak of the Sankofa symbol is either a seed or an egg. And if we think about moving forward with an eye on the past, planting seeds as we go along, I think of that as the approach to playmaking, to art making, to collaboration. And I'm not always certain of the result of these seeds. We often don't live to see what we, we uh, plant made manifest in its full form. Maybe in my obituary, I'll learn more about the, change, the changes that have been made over the course of this little life. But I'm really excited in the idea of seed planting as a means of fostering change in spaces. Yes, um, I would add, um, you can tell that why Sharifa and I continue working together because I enjoy like every time when we work together and hearing all this like wis wisdoms and like really smart words, and um, <laughs> and at this um, for for me um, I think thinking about um, being the change and also forwarded to be uh, change someone and in a way. Um, in design-wise, we really do 
select certain things to put on stage. If we, you, if we think about like design, it's a process of selecting. Selecting different items, objects that we construct another world, another universe on stage. And it's, it's, um, you do have to hold yourself accountability, accountable to make sure that there is a reason why you select certain things and you do have um, enough research and enough uh, knowledge to support that, that you are able to tell those um, story truly. So in a way for me, um, being accountable, um, it's part, part of like, you present something on stage, it might change someone, knowing that you have, whatever you do, you have an effect on people, and you are not working in a silo, and um, every, everything that you do, everything you mm. present, especially theater as a public form, that you, it, it has um, audience, you have to be responsible for the audience, what you present to them, and how they receive it. And I think it's a way to how you position yourself uh, in this world. Yeah, yeah and I, I would add, because Yoshin and I started working together seven years ago um, on that project, Jackie Sibley's Rui, we're proud to present. The deep research that you did speaks to that notion of being responsible and, mm -hmm. and being uh, aware of the impact, the potential for impact in the work that we make together. So much so that your research became the dramaturgical backbone for our work. And that was really exciting to have design lead the research and the, and the way that we would talk about the play in the room. Maybe this is a good moment to look at the first slide of the uh, set for We Are Proud to Present a Presentation. And uh, this is uh, Yushin Chen's um, design. Do you want to talk a bit about uh, this uh, research process and how it changed you yeah, as a designer? Yeah, so um, the research, um, basically this, um, this play is about a genocide that happened to uh, Hiroro people in Namibia. And so um, the process of this play is that we have six actors. Um, they are prepare a presentation of this genocide. And through their dialogue, through their findings, um, um, they are trying to figure out how, how do they present the material and where do they source the material and who wrote this material. And so in a way that I, when I was working on it, I had no idea about this genocide. And I do think for me it's important I do enough research and understanding about the geographic, uh, how they relate to uh, uh, other countries. And then they talk about building a railroad and using Hiroro people uh, as, um, in a way like as of labor to build this and the treatment that they got from, uh, from the, the German people during that time. And in a way, um, you can see um, the research board on, on one side of the stage. Um, it's part of, um, for me, it's part of set dressing, but also I need to make sense how individual image, how they relate to each other. And when we were looking at this train, like this station, like where is it exactly? And how is it relating to the train station they are talking about and then the railroad they are talking about? Where on the map can we find it? And in, in a way that, although it's theater that you don't really get those close up, like as like in, in television, when you do like this like crime, uh, crime scene and then you, you kind of link all these uh, clues together and hints. But for me, I need to make sense of it for myself. So, and I can talk to the actor about how to process this and what exactly these images are for and why they are there. Yeah, it's actually very interesting that that show is a play within a play. It's about actors putting on a show. And what research do actors and designers do? How do we make that visible? So though it was set dressing, it was our real research too. Yes. Um, we even had fake community agreements for the actors who were putting on the show that were pasted up <laughs> in this space. And what that picture doesn't depict is uh, the brilliant idea that Yoshin had with student uh, incredible, brilliant, emerging makers. Students built those walls, and those walls, walls were designed to fall away with, as the play progressed 
we lost all the walls of the room that they were in and the desert that you see sort of in the background, the backdrop, became the space. So we watched the space transform. Talk about change. <laughs> Literal change. Yeah. It was um, at a talk back for one of the productions of this, uh, um, of We Are Proud to Present that um, we first met actually. Yes. And um, I don't know if I, well I think I told you, I don't know if I told you Yushin that I have sub I subsequently uh, was invited to and wrote an essay about this experience uh, for, uh, um, uh, for a, 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 an academic publication and the prompt was, does depicting historical trauma repeat it, you know? Mm. Or like, how do you reenact, how do you take the Sankofa bird image and deliver the past to the present in such a way as to offer uh, the truth, right? Mm -hmm. And to allow for the different, um, you know, emotional reactions to learning that truth, right? Uh, the um, first genocide of the 20th century, right? Um, not well known, I imagine, in this room, let alone in the broader world, right? Um, but it's a sort of, um, it's not necessarily the thing you want to be known for in history. We were the subject of the first genocide, right? And yet you have to tell that history and, um, and, and tell it in such a way that the theater becomes an engine or vehicle for change. And also for the, uh, what I thought was really beautiful about that talk back is that you had integrated directorially your students' reactions to participating in, uh, in this show. Um, so I wanted to uh, ask a, a, a kind of come at Afrofuturism from a second angle. Mm. Uh, we have uh, Octavia Butler in the room and uh, the image of the Sankofa bird. I want to uh, evoke another well-known uh, Afrofuturist or myth scientist, uh, Sun Ra, uh, and one of his famous quotes is, this planet is doomed. <laughs> so. In, uh, in many Afrofuturist uh, uh, narratives, uh, there is a predilection for apocalypse, uh, mm -hmm. for disaster, and uh, you know, even for the end of days or living beyond the end of days. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe also survivalism in a certain way too. So uh, Sharifa, you made a film uh, that I want to show a clip from in a minute. And I want to ask you to talk about Ashland. Uh, and also to talk about what it was like as a theater maker and an interdisciplinary artist to shift to the making of film um, as, during a pandemic and as a result to a large scale uh, worldwide kind of, uh, kind of <laughs> catastrophic event for the world, right? And to sort of take, have a film that has, let me not say more about it actually, let's show the clip and then ask you to talk more about uh, what led you to uh, the making of Ashland. To the apocalypse. To the apocalypse and beyond. And beyond. Our proposal to humanity is simple. We are the ones we've been waiting for. We must heal us. We must cultivate our own joy. We must inhabit spaces in the fullness of our truth. We must love ourselves inclusive of and not in spite of our mortal wounds. We black, we in Oregon. Look at us. Intrigued. Well, that was an incredible uh, production to get to work with Yoshin on uh, as the production designer in, in the year of the pivot, um, where theaters were shut down. It was in many ways an apocalypse, and uh, that gave way to this new modality of creating. Um, what does it mean when everything you know has been sort of taken from you, everything that feels familiar and safe, and you still have an itch or an urge to plant seeds, to tell stories in the spirit of Sankofa. 
And this is where um, Ashland came. And you know, when I think about the apocalypse, having having experienced what we what we continue ex to experience um, at the hands of the pandemic, the multiple pandemics, shall we say, I am beginning to reframe the apocalypse as maybe if it means that the systems that do not serve us have to come to an end, if it means that our uh, unequal, divided society has to come to an end, bring on that apocalypse. Bring on that apocalypse and let's create something new. So maybe we shouldn't be afraid of the apocalypse uh, because oftentimes it is depicted as end of days, as the sky falling, as the planet being doomed. Perhaps reframing it might be the sort of like sort of gateway or entry point into reimagining ourselves. Mm -hmm. So in this film, and I'll, I'll turn to Yoshin as the production designer shortly, we depicted blackness, blackness in Oregon, a state that was designed as a settler white utopia, a place that up until the early 2000s still had counties that had sundown laws in place that meant that if you were black or a person of color and you were in those spaces after dark, your body is at risk. And if we think of Afrofuturism about imagining a future for the black body outside of its current state of oppression, something that people of all backgrounds should get behind, then merely existing as a black body in Oregon, a place not designed for us, was a radical act. And so that's what we tried to celebrate in that film. We depicted an individual who had sort of turned her back on herself. And over the course of uh, meeting another individual, uh, they begin to re-find themselves and re-fall in love and re-engage with themselves. And so that's what we depicted in Ashland, set in Ashland. Designer? Yeah. <laughs> Um, I think this uh, production for me it was a really interesting experience um, because um, it was, of course, during the pandemic, and I think it was 2020 in September 2020, and like thankfully that we had the technology, so we were able to work while Sharifa being in Oregon and me staying in New York during that time. Um, we were able to communicate and really. Um, I think really bring this um, story about realignment um, of yourself um, forward. And I do think um, if it wasn't for the pandemic, I'm sure if I probably would continue doing theater and, and being too busy doing theater without like uh, shifting gears, uh, doing film. Because I do think um, trying different things when it feels like the end of the world. All you can do is try new things. And for me, as Sharifa said, that the end of the world, it might not necessarily be a bad thing. Like you do, you do have to burn the ground and then the new ceiling will start growing. And I do think that's a really, really beautiful metaphor for, uh, uh, for the first film that we worked together. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I think we have some more slides of your uh, design process. Uh, I don't know if it's from Ashland, but it's certainly from Yushin Chen, so maybe if we could see a couple more slides and you could yeah. tell us a little bit about how you go. This, I think, is from Eclipse. Did you want to just tell, what do you want to tell us about? Shout out to Princeton. Yeah. Um, okay, shout yes. out to Princeton. Shout out to Princeton. Um, Eclipse was uh, presented, uh, you know, as a Princeton production with uh, student actors, uh, emerging artists, and over the course of the time that we created this space, I was very fortunate to invite some of my friends from Liberia to come and see the work, and they they were like, "How did you copy paste?" what we saw and experienced there onto this stage. And that was remarkable. In terms of sort of where we were able to plant seeds of hope and joy, Yoshin had this brilliant idea to uh, depict the bullet holes from the Second Civil War uh, in Liberia and uh, basically worked with Alex Mannix, our incredible lighting designer, to, to set up some lights upstage of the bullet holes. And so that when, when in the dark and those bullet holes were lit, they began to shine like stars. 
depicting a sense of hope, possibility, even in the midst of this, uh, of this story of uh, subjugation and, and terror. Yeah, Didn't I, you win an award for this design? Um, not the award. Um, uh, it was part of the inclusion in the US, um, the PQ-19. Uh, and so it was a selection for, uh, to be part of, um, part of the US uh, professional uh, designers. And so it was at Prague and part of their uh, selection. We um, went to Prague, y'all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say for this, this one, as Sharif has said, um, because we, when we start working on this, um, yet another um, terrifying uh, war story, and how do we focus on the humanity within this story? And we have four main characters. How do we make sure that each of their, their, their voice and their decisions are being heard and being taken serious of? And um, so in a way that, um, First of all, as a designer, I do need to do a bunch of uh, background research to really understand where they were in that situation and how was the surrounding. So I went up to like watching some documentary um, and then also some really just a video footage of um, some um, civilians and taking um, um, documenting what's happening around them during the first civil war and then the second civil war. And then, then I need to move on to how, how does one cut cassava? Because um, that's part of like you got to eat and part of this show that these characters, they do like, uh, they show off the, the skin of cassava, they also cut the cassava and cook the cassava. And I was like, I have no idea. This is a diff totally different country, different continent and different, different um, main source of uh, food and so I got to um, do my re my own research on um, how to how to do all that so I can communicate uh, with our prop uh, person just like to make sure that we got a specific on um, like the um, utensils and uh, and the cookware that they will have in their their household and um, in a way that. Um, we try to also create, make sure that individual person have their own impact, individual character have their own impact in their living hood. Um, so we also just like come up with stories and how do we um, make sure that individual um, character, their corners, that has um, their own imprint to these corners. Yeah. Beautiful work. I think we may have some more uh, mm -hmm. So slides, and as we're looking at those, um, oh, uh, yes. another Princeton. Shout out to Princeton. <laughs> okay. uh, this one was a, an amazing uh, uh, opportunity. You know, oftentimes we are artists for hire, like Raja Feather Kelly mentioned in the previous conversation, where we don't get invited to lead the sort of creative process. Um, in this, in this case. Uh, Jane Cox, the head of the theater program, gave us the carte blanche to develop uh, any kind of uh, project that we were interested in. And what we landed on, uh, with the help of our brilliant actors, was a story that explored the recent and ancestral memories of clothing. What does our clothing remember? Uh, we situated it on a uh, port city in, in Kenya um, where oftentimes clothing from the West is, is uh, sent over in these giant bales. And these bales are quite bad for the economy because it shuts down local uh, textile you know, uh, efforts. And so the, the cool thing about the secondhand clothing sort of industry in, in Kenya and much of East Africa is that whether you're the president's wife or whether you are, uh, you, are, you are someone like me, you're likely to wear these secondhand clothes. And in the exploration, using theater to try and undercover these recent and ancestral memories that are inherent in the textiles, we discovered that it's that kind of thinking around decentering de humans and centering something like clothing that is the sort of key to imagining futures that, that consider what does the grass think? 
What do the mountains remember? What does the tree know? When we take away the sort of human supremacy that we, that we have, have, or this, this sort of us above everything else, we can start to really think about future. Yeah. And I think for this project that uh, you can see, like we, uh, we have like heaps of um, secondhand clothing. And that's one thing um, to say that, again, hold yourself accountable that your every action affect not just people around you, but people across the sea. And so every choice that you made, you have to be conscious why and how this might impact other people. And so in a way that um, creating this space, um, we got a bunch of, these are all secondhand clothing. And so um, this, the scene shop was working with me and they came, they came up with a really brilliant idea that uh, in a way that secure those clothing, but after the show, those clothing can also go back and um, be purchased by other people. Like it has the, the second life, the third life. So we are not just wasting and wasting this clothing um, and do more um, kind of provide more trash to the world, that these actually have a purpose after this, and which I think um, in a way as an artist, like as a set designer, we, we, we build out sets and then we throw out after the show. And I just imagine like in my own culture, I probably will go to hell after this uh, <laughs> with all these like sets throughout the years that being, and I would burn in the hell with all these. Um, so I, I feel better um, in a way. <laughs> yeah. I, I, no, I'm just trying to picture like, now yeah. where in Dante's Inferno set designers go. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Waste not, want not. <laughs> but I would say in like, like a Buddhism, um, Buddhism hell, like if you waste food and like at the end of your life and you go down to the hell and then you're going to eat all your leftovers that you had in your past life. And so that's what I was thinking. <laughs> Well, um, you know, uh, I think we're going to see the next slide in a minute, but what you just said, Yushin, is also on an earlier panel, I think yesterday, or maybe it was in a conversation, who knows where, uh, 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 Brandon Jacob Jenkins, one of the hosts of this event, you know, mentioned that um, one of the effects of bringing designers onto the stage, right, is that we actually begin to see the whole supply chain you know, the, all the connections in the theater, right? You know, it's that, so we're bringing in this story about where you source your set and then where it goes afterwards, right? That's just precisely the kind of conversation that, um, that we can actually have by organizing for a, like this one. Yes. Do we have another image from that show or is it actually the... the uh, uh, yeah, this is the Malima. We love to do heaps of things. If it's not a heap of clothing, <laughs> yeah. um, it's, a, it's a heap of, of earth. This is Mlima's Tale by Lynn Nottage. Um, again, a, a piece that asks us to consider uh, our impact and the way that we interact with not only our environment, but uh, the animals in that environment. And again, the way we treat our animals says a lot about the way we treat each other. And so in this piece, we follow uh, the ivory tusks of uh, a great elephant, Mlima, as they traverse landscapes from Kenya again, uh, across the world into to Asia, uh, before landing in a billionaire's home in uh, Beijing. And it's an incredible piece, and uh, once again, a, a heap in our design. Yes, yeah, the hip. Um, so one thing um, I will add to this, um, the story we travel and we see Malima and then being killed and then turn it into tusk and then turn it into, so we call the artwork. The artworks are basically based on um, someone's blood, like the elephant's blood. And so in a way that nobody in this uh, supply chain is innocent, that we can say like, well, it's being carved by someone, um, so it's, it's not my doing, but by purchasing it, making that decision, you are part of this. And so um, in terms of the, the entire course of action that Malima will have, like the, the white chalk powder that um, gets smeared in, um, onto other characters while we go from location to the next. And, 
And as you can see, the set is with the dirt, and we have this, um, the floor is reflective and black. It really looked like a dark water on stage when we, when, when we lit it. And throughout the course of the time that these dirt kind of get dragged onto the surface of the really like the shiny black pool, and at the end, just like really covering everywhere. So this is also another, another way like in design wise, just to, to show like these impact and then how, how we interact with the nature around us that in the end that we do need to find a way, find a way in the way like Lynn Nottage wrote the story and then we tell, as an artist that we have our responsibility to really bring awareness to, to the society, what's happening and really do our job be accountable. One thing that uh, all of these productions make me, uh, a quotation that make me think of is, you know, Chimamanda Adichie's well-known, you know, the danger of a single story, right? And what the two of you as uh, artistic collaborators in the theater are doing is, 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 is multiplying the stories uh, that, um, that, 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 that um, are being told, I guess, about uh, about about Africa and about uh, the Pacific Northwest, a very important <laughs> location in the African diaspora, as we're about to see in the second uh, 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 movie clip. Uh, but um, but I think we actually have some sketches, right, of a current production. Do you want to show those, or do you want to? Sure. <laughs> the, I think the sketches. A little oh, prototype. Yeah, yeah, it's just a prototype. When we were brainstorming and in our like phone call conversation, Sharifa was in the workshop, and I was like talking with her on, on the phone or on, over the Zoom, and then really thinking. And Sharifa like really wanted to play with um, parachute and how the parachute, in a way that looks um, that looks like a, a stereotypical like scientific texture-wise, like the white um, in, within the the spaceship that. Like currently, the the mainstream like television or or uh, the movies that show shows, and so we were interested in taking this parachute and see how we could transform the landscape using it as a as a canvas and transform the landscape, and through the different part of the story, how how do we pull and also the ensemble the ensemble cast. Um, really physically being part of this uh, shape-shifting process. And so you can see like um, the beginning is like the forest and, uh, and then we go into the spaceship and then there is a sort of central figure and so I was hoping that this become part of the body and, um, and, then, and then we lifted one end and that become another location within this uh, kind of a new build um, space. Yeah, this is um, this is Eric Lockley's um, Sweet Chariot, which is actually running now at Under the Radar at the Public, and essentially this is what we would like it to look like in one of its more uh, advanced uh, developments. Mm -hmm. And essentially, we some of the guiding principles for this design were the black body is a technology, your liberation is bound with my liberation, although. The, uh, the, the constellations, we admire the constellations, they cannot see themselves. So those were some of the guiding sort of principles for this design process where we had to create planet Earth, a forest on planet Earth, a spaceship bound to a new planet home for black bodies to travel with ease and free freedom, and then to create planet home. So what better thing to use than a parachute? And so together, Yoshin and I have been sort of, you know, tinkering with the ideas of how to play with that fabric and breathe new life into uh, something that has a very utilitarian uh, sort of sensibility. I uh, am totally fascinated. And um, one thing that, like, thinking about seeing these sketches, imagining this show, which I think is maybe one more opportunity to see. Tonight. This, tonight? Yes, okay, there's a shout tonight. out for that. Uh, but, you know, hopefully beyond. There's so much. Afrofuturism in, uh, let's say, you know, in Hollywood, right? You know, cinema. Wakanda. And what? Wakanda. Wakanda, the world of Wakanda, uh, the warrior queen, you know, the, uh, the, the warrior, um, uh, warrior king. Um, and um, 
any number of artists, including uh, Rashad Newsom, who was here in the Armory last year. Um, what does design for the stage or theater do in particular, not necessarily to kind of compete with that kind of big screen spectacle, but maybe to compete with it or whatever, or offer it an alternative, just come at it differently, come at it differently, imagine it differently. Um, I would say this is something I strongly feel when, when we were in pandemic and nothing really happened and we tried to do this virtual um, virtual theater thing and what I miss so much is being in a space with each other. And I do think um, when you are in a space, you see each other as a three-dimensional human and you share the space and share the energy all together, that is why I'm doing theater. Um, so in terms of when you are sitting back at home and watching something on the television and on the screen, those are still a two-dimensional format, no matter what, it's still an image. And in a way, um, it, kind of, it kind of removed the humanity by a degree, because these are something that living inside this, um, this rectangular device. And so being able to see eye to eye with one another, um, for me, that's why like, the theater will still exist and then we'll continue doing it. Yeah, I mean, it's that, it's that breathing, that collective breath that we all share in, in live spaces or the tomato effect. If I throw a tomato at my screen, nothing will change. But if you were to throw a tomato at us over here, something might change. Um, and, and so in thinking about uh, that, that breath and the, the ability to be r live in real time and, th and thinking about special effects, if we think about Wakanda and flying cars and cool robots and awesome technology, if we start to think of the body as the technology, the black body as the technology, and I'm trying to create an Afro, Afro bot a robot from the future, an Afrofuturistic robot, and all I have is just my body, mm. then I become more interested and I invest more in my movements, in my voice, and, and my audience starts to invest in the body as the primary means of storytelling. And if we're, if we're talking about liberating the black body, and if we place the body at the center of our storytelling, then we, we're doing something, we're onto something, and we may throw a tomato too. <laughs> yeah. Great. Well, um, before this audience throws tomatoes at us, I think we should definitely open it up. Let me ask you this, Sharifa, that we have about five minutes. We could show a clip of you, Go Girl. We should go right to questions. What would you like? Let the people decide. <laughs> Let Who the people decide. You Go Girl? You Go Girl? Okay, okay, let's see the second clip. Do you want to set it up? Yes, You Go Girl is a short film a uh, second short film made in collaboration with Oregon Shakespeare Festival, shot in Ashland, Oregon, and uh, it is about a comedian who has to climb two mountains, the mountain of landing her comedy set and a literal mountain, Mount Ashland, um, in the midst of uh, life. <laughs> no spoilers. Oh. <laughs> Next up, coming to the stage, Audrey Jenkins. <sighs> Being my mother's daughter, it's kind of like living two lives. See, on one hand, I have the life that I want to live. And on the other side is the life that my mama want to carve out for me. <laughs> I think we have time for questions. Yes. Or two, if there's one of the. Okay, I see one in the back there. I just missed the earlier part of this, and I saw that amazing clip, and I just wanted you to maybe give me some context for what that was. Yeah, unpack it. Unpack it for us a little bit. Yes, yeah. let's unpack that. Um, essentially, like. Do you want to know around it or the story or? 
Yes. Um, so again, under pandemic conditions, with furloughed theater workers, theater actors, we all came together for the second time, having had such a wonderful time on Ashland, the first film, uh, to tell a story that is, uh, speaks to my experience as someone who f really discovered a lot of joy and healing in the great outdoors, but noticed that uh, there weren't a lot of hikers who looked like me. And by that I mean black and heavy set and comfortable in, this, in nature. And so uh, we applied for funding through Travel Oregon, the Oregon Tourism Foundation. And there was a grant that kind of fit perfectly. Essentially, it was the Oregon-made grant with the ethos that the outdoors belongs to everyone and that everyone deserves to heal and, and be in nature. Oftentimes, black bodies are depicted in gritty, um, non-nature-like non, non um, spaces. So the, again, radical act, putting a black body in nature and seeing what happens. Um, and so essentially, it's a fish out of water story of uh, this uh, New Yorker who ends up in Oregon with a mission, and that mission is to climb that freaking mountain. And <laughs> Tiffany Mann, the incredible performer, uh, really did that. We climbed a literal mountain while, while filming and uh, ended up on the, the, the top of the peak of Mount Ashland. Um, and it was just surreal, a surreal experience. Yeah. And can I just add one quick thing? I, you know, both of the films feature black uh, protagonists, characters who are living um, in, in the great outdoors, for lack of a better word. In this film, we don't actually see that person, right? But we're, you know, she's referred to in, in um, Ashland, a central protagonist. And uh, that's another resonance, actually, with, um, with Octavia Butler's work, right? As she's sort of imagining Laura and Olamina making the trip mm -hmm. up from uh, Southern California to the Pacific Northwest and then to the stars. Uh, you should, I believe you worked on that as well? Yes, um, I did. And I think um, as a creative team, we all went to all those scoutings and really like embodied like how does one climb and then what do you need and like really looking at surroundings. In the way, um, while being in Ashland, I also feel like um, Something interesting, because um, just my own experience, when I went to the supermarket, I was also counted like, oh, there's like one Asian person. Okay, then I feel like people were looking at me weirdly, and maybe because it's pandemic, um, and thinking like being a, um, Asian in this town, like do I carry any virus? So um, in a way, like I, I think it's ridiculous, but at the same time that, feeling like not belong to here was a part of that experience, which I think um, it actually affect a lot, um, like how I see everything around me. And so in a way, like I appreciate uh, this um, film that I got me to Ashland and really, my, my main job is to support other people's story. That as a designer that I do think I'm a facilitator to help carrying the story and bring it forward. And I think, I, I, I think that's like just like my mission why I'm here. I'm still here in this industry. And so, yeah, in a way, I really do think that film is so beautiful. And I will leave it to that, like the, the nature does not discriminate anyone. Thank you to so much for the beautiful work that you gave us a taste of here today and for giving us insight into your creative process. Uh, and um, we really look forward to uh, seeing more from both of you. In seven years' time. In seven years. Hopefully, it won't take another seven years for us to be in dialogue again. Thank you all for uh, being here.